Okay, it's 520. Let's get started. A few announcements for today. So the exam is next Wednesday. Uh, it will be September 23rd, Wednesday in class. So during, well, during the regular class time plus a 30 minute grace period for submitting your exam online. So take a look at the Canvas announcement that I sent out earlier. That has information on the exam about the times, the rules for the exam, and where you can find the review problems and the practice problems. So take a look at that. And then, so let's take a look at the assignments on Canvas also. They're coming up. You have pre-lab due, due uh, this Thursday and quiz four due Friday. So take a look at that. My office hours will be right after class. If you have any questions on homework or, or anything, really quizzes, homework, and anything about the exam. So come see me after class if you have questions. Also, the TAs have their office hours posted and their links to Zoom posted. So if you need help any day of the work week, uh, we've got office hours every day, so definitely come join if you need some help or just want to chat about something. And as always, uh, unmute if you have a question or shoot me a chat and I'll try to see it. And otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise low. Okay, so let's get started with the real material. I wanted to show a pre-lab preview or a lab preview of lab three. So what you see on the screen right here, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is our two circuits. And these circuits are the subject of the lab you will be starting this Friday. So the way these labs, these circuits, this lab ties to the class is you're going to do node voltage analysis on the circuit on the left to figure out the node voltages. Um, and you're going to compare your measurements with calculations. So you're gonna see how, well, you're gonna calculate, you're gonna get pretty close to what you measure, and you're gonna see connecting the positive and negative leads of the voltmeter to the circuit. Uh, I think that'll reinforce what node voltages are. You'll also calculate power supplied by the source and absorbed by the loads. And what you're gonna find is, surprise, surprise, all the power delivered by or supplied by the source gets delivered to the load. That's conservation of energy. On the right, you'll see the same circuit without the source, and you're going to de de determine the input voltage from uh, calculated voltage and current, and also measured voltage and current. So you'll see those, those will match. So it's a really good lab for comparing what you're doing in class, this theory, to what you're going to see on your breadboard and the measurements you take. <clears throat> so that's coming up. What I'd like to do is actually uh, start the class with a clicker question from the topic last class, so a Thevenin and equivalent clicker. So let me switch over here. <clears throat> to a clicker problem, a handwritten clicker problem. So take a look at this problem. You have to find the Thevenin equivalent of this circuit. It only has a current source and a single resistor in it. So find the Thevenin equivalent of that circuit. And that is going to look like, well, right, step one is create a schematic that represents the Thevenin equivalent. That's shown at the upper right here. And remember the Thevenin voltage is the open circuit voltage between A and B. So you don't connect anything to the circuit. You just calculate the voltage between A and B as it is. And then the Thevenin resistance, if you're lucky, right, you have no dependent sources. You only have independent sources, which this is here. And so you can zero out your source and then figure out the resistance between A and B, and that's your Thevenin resistance. Okay, so give that, oh, I don't know, 20 more seconds. And if you don't have it at 15 seconds from now, take a guess, you'll get your clicker credit.
Okay, five seconds. And time. Okay, so uh, here is how I solved for, for VT. I'm trying to find the open circuit voltage at the terminals at A and B. So the voltage with the polarity VOC I show here, and that's equal to VT. Uh, the terminals with nothing connected have zero amps coming out of them or into them. So all of the two amps that comes out of the source goes down through the seven ohm resistor. And remember the voltage VOC is the voltage between the two nodes A and B. The whole top node is A, the whole bottom node is B. That's also the voltage across that seven ohm resistor. So VOC is two amps through seven ohms, two times seven, 14 volts, and that's VT. For RT, uh, you find the resistance between the two terminals when you zero out the source. So to zero out the current source, in other words, zero amps, you open up the current source, take it out of the circuit, essentially, that makes zero amps flow. You look into terminals A and B, or put an ohmmeter there between A and B, and you'll see the only thing left is a seven ohm resistor. So uh, RT is, is seven ohms. So let's see, coming down, that would be, if I got this right, C right there. Okay. So that's a fairly straightforward Thevenin problem. Could you have used node, uh, node voltage analysis or to uh, solve for VOC as well? You sure could. You'd actually get uh, the, the same, you'd get an, uh, an equation that looks a lot like Ohm's law. If you write, if you put a uh, ground at the bottom here um, and you call VOC the top node voltage uh, and then you write your KCL, you'll actually get the, the, the same equation. That would work also. Okay, all right, so there are practice problems and review problems that have to do with uh, node voltage. Check out Canvas for that. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is move on to the next topic. So I showed you the course roadmap last time and uh, once we finished it, we finished up maximum power transfer. And so let's start into capacitors and inductors. So what you see on the screen now are, well, capacitors and inductors. They are both energy storage devices. They store some amount of energy. Capacitors, the mechanism is an electric field. Inductors, the mechanism is a magnetic field. And that's how you're storing energy. We typically use them uh, for their I versus V characteristic. So we're going to talk a lot about the current and voltage relationship for the two terminals of these two components. These are capacitors uh, that probably look like the ones in your kit in the upper left. That's an electrolytic capacitor. It looks like a cylinder. These are ceramic capacitors down at the bottom. On the right, these are inductors. Uh, they look like a coil of wire because they are. Even these chips down here at the bottom are coils of wire around a core. Uh, the core might be a ferrite material or it might just be air. So you can take a coil of wire, uh, or take a wire and coil it up and then you have an inductor. So we're gonna talk about those uh, today. So what I'm going to do is we're going to move to the whiteboard now. Let me just focus here. And Professor Newhall, there's some questions in the chat. Oh yes, let's see. Man, my chat disappears every time I change configurations here. Thanks for letting me know. Let me start that up. Okay. So even if we don't have any clicker questions during lecture, should we always check into class via uh, Reef? No, that's not necessary. Only when we have uh, clickers. Okay, and so that those clickers will count as one homework. So if you get if you answer half of the clicker questions or a question during half of the clicker sessions, uh, you will get full credit for that.
Okay. All right. So let's take a look at capacitors. Um, Capacitors are, well, in theory, really easy to make. Actually, in practice, you could. If I take a metal plate, okay, that's a, a, con a conducting plate, and below it, let's say, I put another conducting plate, and I attach a wire to that bottom plate, I, I have a, a capacitor. And I say metal plates, but it's any, anything that uh, conducts in any way. So uh, in between this, these metal plates, you actually have an insulator. It could be air. It could be some kind of ceramic material. Uh, we call that a dielectric. And so let's draw the schematic symbol for a capacitor and talk about what happens. So let me define a voltage and a current for this two terminal device. Let's define the voltage with that polarity and as we usually do, let's define current into the positive side of the voltage. Okay, I'm going to put a, a, a draw voltage as a function of time and current as a function of time. We're typically interested in, well, many times interested in AC waveforms, which vary versus time. So let me put the, the uh, time variable T in there. So what happens if I take the voltage and I start at zero volts and I assume I just took these plates together, I put them together, there's no charge stored, I just have two metal plates connected to wires and I do something external to this capacitor to cause the voltage to increase from zero uh, in the positive direction. What happens is there's an electric field uh, formed uh, between the plates uh, and, and because of, you have charges that are stored on those plates, that form on those plates. So as I turn up the voltage from zero, I get more and more charge. This uh, uh, positive charge is attracted to the negative side of the capacitor, right? Positive charge actually leaves, it's repelled by the positive charge on the top of this capacitor. So you get charge uh, accumulated on, on these plates and then in between an electric field. Um, there is a relationship between uh, the capacitor, capacitor geometry, let me just pin my, video here. There's a relationship between this capacitor geometry and the voltage and how much charge gets stored on this capacitor. So that relationship is this, Q equals C times V. Okay, Q is charge. We talked about that in the beginning of class. Uh, C is a constant, it's capacitance and it is determined again by the geometry and materials of the capacitor. We're not gonna get deep into this, but I'll point it out that that value C is called capacitance. Um, and you can express that C value uh, with these terms, epsilon, which is a property of the dielectric. It's called the dielectric constant. Uh, a, the area of these plates, divided by D, the distance between these plates. Normally in circuits, uh, we don't care too much about this. Usually you have a capacitor, uh, unless you're trying to build one or do build some special circuit where you have a homemade capacitor, but usually you're given a capacitance value and uh, you, you care about the circuit effects. You care about current flowing voltage being formed um, 
and not so much about the geometry of the capacitor. But I wanted to show you capacitance is, capacitance is constant uh, because the properties of this capacitor are, are constant. Okay. Question. Professor Newhall? Yes. Is it convention to draw the positive side of the electric field to match the voltage? Uh, it is. If I had a negative voltage here, uh, I would have negative charge at the top. So if, if voltage is a positive, yeah, voltage is a positive value, you're going to have positive charges at the top. Also, I have a question. Sure. I thought the dielectric constant was represented by kappa, like, or is kappa a different variable? I remember in phys two, there was some variable kappa that did something. It might be in electrical engineering versus physics. It's typically epsilon. In fact, okay. eps epsilon uh, is, is typically a value that is some relative constant times uh, the uh, permittivity of free space, which is epsilon naught. So it's common to use this notation in electrical engineering. But it very well might be represented with kappa in a, in a physics book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this, let's look at this equation here. That tells us how much charge is stored on a capacitor for a given voltage. As voltage goes up, the charge stored increases. If the voltage is zero, there's no charge stored on that capacitor. Okay, what's a little more interesting for, from a circuit's perspective, a lot more interesting, is taking the derivative of this equation. So if I say, uh, if I take the derivative, uh, dq dt, that's going to be equal to C, right? C is a constant, it comes out, dv dt. Okay, and dq dt from day one of class is current, right? The change of car, uh, charge versus time. So I of t equals C dv dt. So out of, uh, all that I've said so far, this is the big takeaway. This is the most important thing that uh, you should remember from this whiteboard right now, that the current for a capacitor is defined here is a constant known as the capacitance written on the side of the capacitor uh, times the derivative of voltage. So if you look at this, when voltage is constant, uh, I is zero, right? Because the derivative of voltage would be zero. There's only current as voltage is changing. And what that really means is that as voltage changes, the charge stored on the capacitor is changing. So you have current flowing uh, as the capacitor is increasing in voltage, its voltage is increasing. You have charge flowing into the capacitor. And as the voltage is decreasing, right, you have a negative derivative, uh, charge is flowing the other way. Charge actually isn't crossing this uh, dielectric, this insulator. It, charge is just getting stored on the capacitor, released from the capacitor, maybe charged with the opposite polarity. Uh, but that from the outside of the capacitor looks like current flow. And that current flow is described by I equals C dV dt. So if you have voltage and you want to find current, this is the equation to use. If you have current and you want to find voltage, well, just use the integral. So the integral form looks like this. Uh, the voltage is equal to one over C, right? Move C to the other side. The integral of, well, presumably you start at some point in time. We're gonna call that T zero, you know, pick a time. And then you're going to go forward in time to time T. Okay, so initial condition at time T zero, and then you're, then you're moving forward in time to time T. And then you're going to integrate current. And we're going to use a, a variable of integration that your book uses. We're just gonna call it tau. It's just a time variable over which we're integrating. And then d tau, right, variable of integration. So integrate current. And then presumably there was some initial voltage at T0. So there could be, that capacitor could have had a charge at time T0. So we say, let's add on uh, the voltage at time T0. Okay, so this is an equivalent takeaway. If you're if you have current and you need to find voltage, use the bottom equation, okay? So let's work 
a uh, an example. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a capacitor with a voltage across it, a known voltage. We'll figure out current, and we're going to use I equals C dV dt. Question. Yes. For the voltage integral, um, is variable tau just what would be t if the uh, variables that uh, we're integrating over weren't time already? Like it's, it's yeah. a time interval between time one and time two, basically. It is. It's just a time interval. Yeah, it's right. time in seconds. Mm -hmm. It's just that I used t as my independent variable for v, so I don't want to use that again. All right. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's do an example. Uh, professor, sorry, I had another question. Yes. Um, so, and, and I don't think um, my understanding, like we won't be dealing with um, the capacitance equation as much since it's set for like a certain capacitor that we'll be using like in circuits. Mm -hmm. But um, so, and is A the area of just the one plate or both of them? It's the, it's the area of one of the plates. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's assumed that you have two equal area plates that are close to each other. All right, and then epsilon is just based on the material property that the capacitor is made of? It is, it is. Okay. Air has an epsilon and ceramic has a different epsilon. Yes. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. That's right. So let, let's uh, work an example here. Let me draw something and then I'll focus this. Okay, so we have this capacitor, it's capacitance C, and it is a 10 microfarad capacitor. So capacitance is given in farads. And typically we deal with microfarads or nanofarads or picofarads in lab. And what we want to do is find I of T, the current uh, into that capacitor, right through that capacitor, essentially you could say. But remember, charge doesn't cross that dielectric boundary there. So let's define a voltage across this capacitor. Let's say it's a sine wave. So we'll talk about sinusoids later, but you have ten, sine 10 to the sixth T. So that's uh, uh, a million radians per second. Okay. Well, this is a direct application of I equals C D V D T. I have current pointing into the positive side of the voltage across the capacitor, right? If I had current going the other way, you'd have to put a negative sign here, right? Just like Ohm's law or you know, flip the current and write a negative sign uh, for the for the new arrow into the positive sign. And so I can calculate this. I have 10 times 10 to the negative 6 farads, right, times the derivative of this voltage. So the derivative of sine is cosine. Take the radian frequency out in front. Okay, and I wind up with 10 cos 10 to the sixth T. So that's going to be the current amps. So what you'll notice here when you start working with capacitors and sinusoids, the, the amplitude or the uh, yeah, the amplitude of this cosine is dependent upon the frequency of the sine because that 10 to the sixth came out of the frequency term of the cosine. We'll see more about this later. But uh, this amplitude, the size of that current, is going to change based on the frequency of the voltage. You can imagine this lets you build circuits that are dependent on frequency, like filters like filters that pass low frequencies of audio to subwoofers, high frequencies of audio to tweeters, uh, capacitors and inductors have responses that depend on frequency. 
And you can do things with that, like build filters that reject or pass different frequencies. We'll talk about that when we get to phasers. Okay, any questions on this example? <clears throat> okay, let's talk inductors. So inductor, as I, I showed you in, on, on the uh, intro slide, is a coil of wire. And let's define on this cartoon here a current I. If I is 0, uh, then there's no magnetic field. As you increase current I, you start building up a magnetic field around this inductor. So if I put a little bit of I in, a little bit of current, you actually get, for any wire, you get a magnetic field around the wire, around its sort of circumference, uh, but in, in the air around it. When you coil a wire, the magnetic field looks like this. It goes through the center of the coil, and then out around the outside. And as you increase the magnitude of that current, the magnetic field grows, it gets stronger. Okay, let's draw the schematic symbol for an inductor and I'll relate what's happening with that magnetic current and its effect on voltage. So there is an inductor symbol. Let's draw I of T into the top of the inductor. And I'm going to define V of T, again, with its positive side uh, oriented such that current comes in to the positive side of the voltage. OK, so here's what happens. When you change, uh, you're probably, you've probably heard of generators, familiar with generators. If you change the magnetic field, through a coil, you generate a voltage. Okay, you can look up uh, uh, Faraday's law and and read a lot about it, the physics about that. But if you change the magnetic field through a coil, you're going to induce a voltage across that coil. That magnetic field can actually be caused by the current going through the coil. Okay, so in other words. If I have current flowing through this coil, two amps, I have a certain magnetic field. If I try to increase that current from two amps to three amps, I've changed not only the current, but I've changed the magnetic field. That magnetic field is through the coil and it's changing. So that induces a voltage, okay? If I try to decrease the current from three amps down to one amp, um, I'm changing the current that causes a change in the magnetic field, that causes a voltage to be induced. And there's a relationship between the voltage induced uh, and that change of current. Let's define L, which is the inductance of that coil. And it's in units of Henry's, H-E-N-R-Y-S, because it's a plural of a guy's name. Um, so usually you'll see millihenries, microhenries, uh, maybe nanohenries as typical units. The inductance is based on the geometry of the coil. So let's suppose this is a copper wire. Uh, what's the geometry you can change? You could change the number of turns. You could change the spacing between term, turns. You could change uh, the length of the coil. You can change the diameter of the coil. Uh, you could change uh, the shape of the coil. It could be a toroid versus just a cylinder like this. So there are, uh, you can calculate this. There are formulas to go calculate the inductance based on the geometry of the coil. But what we're typically given in circuits class is an inductance value. You can make one um, or you can go buy one and you'll have an inductance value. 
Okay, the so that relationship between the the changing current and the voltage is given by this equation. Okay, V equals L times di dt. So that's the big takeaway for this whiteboard here. A voltage is induced when current changes because the magnetic field is changing through that coil. When there's no changing or no change of magnetic field, right, that, uh, that means current is not changing, then the derivative is zero. So the voltage is zero. So if you have a DC current, a constant current flowing through a coil, the voltage across that coil of wire is zero. As soon as you try to change that current to another, uh, another value, then the slope of that change times the inductance is the voltage induced. Okay. And, and so you can see again, um, you have a derivative here. So as you apply sines and cosines uh, for current, you're going to have voltages that change with frequency. Again, another basis for filters. I'll show you another cool application in a minute. So if I want the uh, current given the voltage, there's an integral form. So one over L, the integral from some starting time T naught to the time at which we're interested in the current. Right. Again, I'll use this uh, dummy variable, tau, right? Plus, and outside of this integral, is the initial current at time zero. Okay, so that's the integral form. Okay, I'll show you an application next. Any questions on, on an inductor, the kind of the basics of it? Um, is there a formula for inductance? We should know like how uh, we covered the formula for capacitance. Right, there, there is a formula. There's a common formula called Wheeler's formula, and it's, um, it's for a cylindrical coil. Let me back up. You don't have to know it. You won't have to calculate inductance of a coil. It's good to know because uh, inductances are really easy to make. Practical values of inductances are easy to make. So um, if you don't have an inductor and you need an inductor, we won't use one for this class, but you could use Wheeler's formula. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's try a practical application. I'll start out with you know, theoretical application and then make it practical. Okay, let's suppose you have a 10 volt voltage source and you have a switch. So you're going to control current flow from that source with that switch. And then I just attach an inductor And that inductor is a two Henry inductor. That's a big inductor. And we're going to close the switch at T equals zero. So this notation means at T equals zero, we'll, we'll close that switch. When the switch is open, no current is flowing. When the switch is closed, current is allowed to flow through that switch. My video disappears every once in a while for some reason. So what we want to find uh, is I of T, where I of T is the current through the inductor. And so what I'll do is I'll define a voltage here, uh, V of T, as the voltage across that inductor. Okay, let's do a plot. Let's create a plot of voltage versus time. Uh, for that inductor. So this is V of T versus did, time. Did you are, like just decide that that was how the um, inductor was like how like which side was the plus side and the minus side and which direction I of T was going? Is that something we'll be given or like something so, that you decided on? Yeah, if you're given a uh, a polarity and a direction, then definitely, definitely use it. Um, if not, you can just make it up. 
And even if you made up uh, the voltage with the opposite sign, opposite polarity, and had current, even as drawn here, the equations will still all work. You have to, you, you would have to change the orientation of the current into the positive side of V in order to use the equation I just showed you. But, but it, the answer would not be wrong. If you define a polarity and you define a reference direction and you follow the, you know, follow the rules, uh, your answer would be right. But in this case, what I did is I just, uh, I just arbitrarily picked positive on the top and I'm gonna draw current into the positive side so that I can just use the equation as it's written. Okay, thank you. Sure. So let's take a look at what happens here. Before t equals zero, so let's call it zero here. Before t equals zero, I have a coil of wire that's connected on one end and not on the other end. There's no change in current through that coil, it's just zero. So I have uh, zero current before time zero. Then as soon as that switch closes, I've connected that 10 volt source uh, directly to that inductor. So the voltage instantaneously goes up to 10 volts across that inductor. Let's take a look at the current. Oops, I have two. All right, let's line those plots up. Now let's figure out what that current is, is going to look like. Okay, I'm going to use the integral form of that equation. I of t equals one over L times the integral from some starting time. Let's, let's start integrating at time zero because the value of voltage is zero before time zero. So that's a good time to start. We're gonna integrate to time t Right, to get this expression of current versus time, we're going to integrate voltage versus the time variable, right, plus I at the start time. Okay, so I at the start time is, is zero. Right? right as this switch was thrown, we had zero current, so this is zero amps. We'll talk more about the initial condition when we start solving first order circuits. So that term is zero. So what I wind up with is one over L, one over two Henry's times, okay, so this uh, voltage after time zero goes to uh, 10, right? Um, and so I'm integrating 10 with respect to tau evaluated at zero and T. Okay, so if you integrate 10, you get 10 tau, right? Integrate 10 d tau plus zero. So I wind up with 5t as the current. Okay, all right, so what that means is, let's, let's draw that current here. Current is zero when the switch is open, and then the current ramps up with a slope of five, like that. So at, oh, let's say one second, you're at five amps flowing. Now this isn't so great to do this. I wouldn't recommend actually connecting a circuit together like this because this current keeps going up, right? There's nothing to stop this current theoretically uh, from going to infinity. What really happens is this, that either the power supply reaches its limit on its output current and output power, um, and so the voltage uh, drops off to zero, right? So that's a limitation of the power supply, or probably more likely with a thin wire is that there is, so there is resistance in, in every wire, especially, especially thin wires, and the wire would get hot and it would break and it would burn out. So this isn't a good idea to do, uh, to close a switch and keep current flowing through an inductor like this from, from a voltage source. Um, but something interesting happens. Let's, let's suppose that we open the switch at, so we open the switch at uh, t equals one second, just to see what happens. So when you, open a switch 
the current tries to stop instantaneously, right? I'm, I'm taking the contacts, I'm separating them, the current's gonna try to stop. So the current is gonna try to do that, fall right down to zero amps. Okay, so what's, what's that mean? Um, well, what's that mean to voltage? Well, voltage, remember, is V equals L di dt. And so I have a current that because of the switch, I've caused to have that straight down slope, which is a negative infinity slope, right? In theory, it's negative infinity. And so I am multiplying L times negative infinity to get voltage. So what really happens is this. I mean, in theory, you have a delta function coming down to negative infinity. Uh, but what really happens in the real world is this. This voltage gets so big in the negative direction, negative hundreds, negative thousands of volts, that as the switch is opening, you're going to get a spark between the contacts. So you're actually ionizing air and having charge cross air when the voltage gets big enough, and you'll get an arc, and eventually you'll burn out that switch because the, uh, the terminals will burn out from the heat of the arc. So, okay. Well, that doesn't seem that good, but I told you this would be a practical application. Uh, well, you can create a spark like this. This is actually a good thing for uh, igniting fuel and air in an internal combustion engine. So let's suppose that you take, so this is the theory, this is the example, this is just of interest. I wanna show you a practical application. You don't have to know the details about this, but I think you'll be interested. If you have, let's say, a 12 volt uh, battery, maybe a resistor, and this, this switch that opens and closes, that's timed with the engine. That's what a distributor used to do, electronic ignition does today. And then you take an inductor and another inductor right next to it. This is called a transformer. We're not gonna study these, but I just wanted to show you again, it's a practical application. What a transformer does is one coil is coupled to the other magnetically. So when you get a change in magnetic field in one coil, that change in magnetic field happens across the other coil. If that other coil has more turns, right, the second coil has more turns than the first coil, what you get is an increase in voltage. So you've taken this already big negative voltage right here and you made it even bigger with this transformer. And so what you'll get right there is when you close the switch for a little bit, you'll get current flowing. And then when you open the switch, you get a spark right there. And so that th these two terminals right here would be the terminals at the end of the spark plug where the spark happens, okay? So that's how you can create a spark and fire an internal combustion engine. Uh, so professor? Yes. So in the circuit that we were just looking at um, in the problem, if we opened the switch, would a spark then occur in the switch or? Yeah, it'll occur in the switch because okay. right here, yep, you get this huge voltage across the inductor. The source stays at 10 volts. So that huge voltage is taken across the contacts of the switch. And so as the switch opens, you'll get arcing and usually you burn out the switch eventually. Okay, so mathematically, what's happening with the voltage? Uh, math, like, like theoretically, what's happening is if you have a negative infinite slope of your current, right? If this is an ideal switch, not a practical switch, right? Let's suppose you can stop current instantaneously. You're going to have a delta function, right? This delta function has, um, uh, uh, it's, it, it goes down to negative infinity. It has an a area of one, actually one times whatever the, voltage was. Um, so mathematically, you would represent it with this delta function. And that delta function comes out of this equation here. So if you have I fall from five amps with, with negative infinity slope down to zero amps, you take the derivative of that at one second, you get a delta function, uh, negative delta function times L. So times, oh, it would be two. So you get you get two times the delta function, and that's what this red arrow is. Now, okay. in this class, you're not going to be dealing with uh, special cases like that, but I did want to show you, well, this is actually a very important practical consideration 
when you are working with switches because you can burn switches out and when you're controlling things with a microcontroller or a digital circuit we'll get to that because if you turn off current through a motor for example instantaneously you're going to have a big voltage that could blow out your chips and we'll talk oh. about that okay gotcha mm -hmm. all right thank you sure okay other questions on this example Okay. All right. So these are the basics of capacitors and inductors. And what I'd like to do now is start introducing you to circuits that are, again, practical. Um, they're used as timer circuits. They're, they're used as filters. And so we're going to look at first order circuits and actually in general, RLC circuits. Let me bring that up. Okay, so let's talk about first order circuits. Let's define what a starting point here, what I mean. So when you have circuits with only resistors, let's start there. Circuits bef before today, your circuits only had sources and resistors. When the source is turned on, right? That means you have an instantaneous change in voltage or current, um, or a switch position is changed, then the voltages and the currents in the circuit change instantaneously. So the voltage, for example, across one of these resistors could go from three volts to eight volts with an infinite slope. It would change instantaneously, assuming this is a perfect resistor. Um, if you flip a switch in a circuit, maybe all of the voltages and all of the currents change instantaneously. That can happen in resistive only circuits. In circuits with capacitors, inductors, and resistors, as you saw, there's a derivative in the voltage versus current relationship. So with Cs, Ls, and Rs, when a source is turned on or equivalently a switch position is changed, some voltages and currents do not change instantaneously. Right. They have some kind of time domain response. That time domain response is called a transient response. So you're transitioning from one voltage to another, uh, and we call that the transient response. And it's defined as the time varying change of voltage or current that results from a sudden change in the circuit. So what's a sudden change? A sudden change is a source turning on, a resistor being pulled out, um, a, a switch being flipped. So that's, that's what a sudden change in the circuit is. In general, when you have resistors, capacitors, and inductors in a circuit, as you saw, there was a, a, a derivative between I and V, right? The relationship between I and V had a derivative. And you will wind up with, once you do your Kirchhoff's voltage law or Kirchhoff's current law equation, you'll wind up with a second order circuit, right? Just like this. Um, so you have a second derivative, a first derivative, the variable itself equals a constant. That's what you'll wind up with. If you have only R's and C's or R's and L's, you wind up with a first order circuit, which has a first order derivative, right? DVDT, there's no second derivative here. Um, so in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to deal with, with first order circuits. So we're going to have circuits that have resistors and capacitors or resistors and inductors. And we're gonna wind up applying KVL, KCL, Ohm's law, voltage division, current division, whatever you need to write an equation to find the variable you're looking for. Okay, and the equation will look like this. So what I'm going to start with next time is a, a, an example of an RC circuit. So we're gonna start with an RC circuit we're going to create the first order differential equation and solve that first order differential equation to get V of T. And then we're gonna look at a second technique using an RL circuit. Again, we're gonna wind up with a first order differential equation uh, for that circuit describing current in that case. And, and I'll show you another way to solve, uh, solve these problems, okay? All right, well, it is 610 
right now. So I'm going to close down the class now and start up office hours. Uh, don't forget there is an exam next Wednesday, 923. Take a look at that announcement on Canvas and take a look at the practice problems and review problems on Canvas. Also check out the assignments uh, coming up that are due this week. Uh, check out the Slack workspace if you haven't already, if you need some help with homework or ideas, even just browse for ideas on how to solve the homework problems because uh, folks are posting um, help out there, including me. And um, so that's all I have for today. Thanks for joining the class. I hope it's working out well. I love the feedback. Thanks for the feedback that you have been providing and uh, we'll do what I can to resolve any issues. So let's end it here and I'll start office hours in about two minutes. So stick around if you want to ask questions or hear other people's questions. And if not, I'll see you next time.